Hello. <laughs> I felt drawn to share with you uh, a practice that's really near and dear to me. It is a meditation practice. And it's actually really simply called letting go while lying down. So if there's anything that's happening in your world that you are ready to let go of or surrender, um, the practice is very simple. You can lay down in your bed or on the floor, wherever you have space. Lay down on your back, relax your entire body. And as we breathe, I'll guide you through a relaxing, grounding practice. And I often do this practice um, with a bit of a visualization. So at first I'm just letting go of everything that's showing up for me. Any thoughts? any ruminations from the week, any things that are showing up in my personal life. And then after that, I allow myself to rest in a state of pure surrender. And this has been um, something I've been doing for the last four or five years. And it's been really beneficial to get myself into a state of being that's altogether new, showing up to life with a state of surrender, still present to who I am. And what I'm about in my personal mission, but also <laughs> ready and available to be a conduit to co-create with the divine. So that visualization is basically a, imagining a trapeze at the small of your back, relaxing and letting that be your support. And as you look at the edges of the trapeze, strings that go up, right? if you know the circus, and those are all supported by divine light, the divine source. So in that space, you allow yourself to be held and open and available to whatever wants to come through, any insights, or just a moment to really relax and surrender, or something in between, maybe a mixture of both. Um, before I begin, I'm going to do something a little different. I am not by any means a tarot card reader um, or medium or psychic or anything of that nature. However, I do have this deck of angel cards that I like to get a bit of intuitive inspiration from for the practice. And so tonight I'm just going to connect to our collective energy, a little collective, and we'll pull one card. And we'll read about the card and what it has to say. And then that can be an anchor point for your practice. If you're not sure where to put your mind as we meditate, you can lean back to whatever is the theme of the card that we pull for this session. I said a card, but we have three cards here. So we're just going to go with that. And let's see what is coming up here. Okay. Well, this is promising. The first one is the Ace of Raphael. And the Ace of Raphael is a positive new emotional experience. Fulfilling romantic relationships, deep and lasting spiritual insights. <laughs> That's quite lovely. I'm going to read uh, the fuller expression of this card here from the book. And so as I read, you can take what resonates. And if it feels a little dissonant, that's okay. So the Ace of Raphael. This is the beginning of a new and positive emotional experience. It may be a new person you become very close to or a situation that fills you with joy. Often this card signifies the start of a romantic relationship or renewed romance within your current relationship. You may find yourself falling in love or making a deep and personal connection with a new friend. Profound and lasting spiritual insights are possible at this time. Trust your intuition to lead you to happiness. 
this card's theme, spiritual revelation, a gift from someone dear. Home is where the heart is. The second card that came out was the Ten of Raphael. And it says, love and blessings fill your life. Harmonious relationships with family members, happily ever after. The Ten of Raphael. Love and blessings fill your life. This is a beautiful moment where it seems as though you have it all. Your family is loving and happy. You may still work hard, but there is a feeling of satisfaction and peace when you come home. Your relationships with your children or other family members are peaceful and harmonious. Relationships can be a lot of work, but they're worth it. Your hopes and dreams are within reach. If it's a beautiful home life you're seeking, you're on the right path. All right. Hmm. And the last one is Three of Michael. And this one says, release the past. You will grow from this situation. Time heals all wounds. Three of Michael. You will grow from this situation. When challenging events occur, it's important to take time to heal. You do not have to do it alone. Ask your angels and guides or friends for assistance. Forgive everyone involved, including yourself, for actions or choices you may see as having been unkind or in error. Time truly does heal all wounds. Ask your angels and guides to help you see the reason for the situation in your life. A new perspective could allow you to view things in a different light. Know that you will become a stronger person over time because of this challenge. Hmm. So as we get into this practice, the three cards here that we have, the Ace of Raphael, you can hold on to whatever resonates, a positive new emotional experience, fulfilling romantic relationships, deep and lasting spiritual insights, and or the Ten of Raphael. Love and blessings fill your life. Harmonious relationships with family members, happily ever after. And finally, the Three of Michael. Release the past. You will grow from this situation. Time heals all wounds. Hmm. All right, so this practice we're gonna get into tonight is about letting go and preferably laying down actually. So as you hear the sounds of the guitar, you can lay down and allow yourself to relax into a meditative state and let go. And I'll guide you through the practice.
become present to the way that you two move life in each and every moment, simply by being.
grounded and present in the body.
you exhale, let it all go.
insights that have come with deep reverence and gratitude. And if your insight was simply a moment to rest and be also hold that with reverence and gratitude.
placing the palms of your hands together over heart center. The love, light, and truth within me honors the love, light, and truth within you. Namaste. you for joining me for this practice. Um, I'm open to hold a little space if anyone wants to share or has a question about their experience or meditation. And um, if you don't, you need to go, that's okay too. But I'll be here for a little while longer if anyone has any anything they want to share. Mm. My next retreat, in person, still working that out on the calendar, but um, at the beginning of 2025, I'm doing a 30-day meditation challenge called The Heart of Authenticity, and it's all about reconnecting to your authentic nature and self-love through the gifts of mindfulness. Um, it'll be each evening around the same time, actually, 7.30 to 8 Central. Um, so if you want to sign up for that, it's virtual. And it's on my website now. Just look for The Heart of Authenticity. And sign up for my mailing list if you're wanting to be the first to know about um, in-person retreats. There'll be more. But uh, I don't have specific dates for you yet. How do we begin to navigate loneliness? Hmm. Good question. My advice regarding loneliness and navigating that emotion is first acceptance. And one of the ways I love to accept any emotion that I'm feeling is just acknowledging it's there and you can talk to it. And there's a couple of things that happens when you communicate with it. Um, but you would start first with this simple format of, Dear Loneliness, I know you're there and I promise I'll take good care of you. And when you acknowledge it, there's a bit of ease because usually if we're experiencing an emotion that is undesirable, there's a resistance. So simply by acknowledging it, we let go of the weight of resistance, or lighten it, soften it. And then by committing to taking good care of it, we make ourselves available to ways of taking it along with us throughout our day, throughout each moment, whatever it is that has stirred the emotion of loneliness, whether it's a, a new breakup or not being seen or heard in a certain space or not having um, access to those loved ones. It's always connected to a mental formation. So that helps to let go of the formation of resistance as well as being present to those emotions. And there's a softness and openness and at a certain point, you can get to a space of not needing the loneliness, meaning I'm not attached to having to have my life be in a certain fixed position. <laughs> right. And that fixed position could be, oh, I have to be around or connected in this way. Because loneliness doesn't necessarily just mean that we're alone. Right. Loneliness means we're in a state of desire or a state of lack, right? Relative to another or a place or whatever it might be. And when you surrender those things, you stop needing the loneliness. You can also recognize that even though that person, place or thing isn't accessible or available in your life, 
There's also an abundance around you, right? Whatever it is that you do have. So as you take good care of your loneliness, temper it with gratitude and availability to every other thing you have, right? You might have your home, your bed, your favorite comfort items, whatever they might be, your hobbies and other people in your life. And in that way, you liberate yourself from needing the loneliness, so to speak. Because uh, one of the gifts we've been given is our biology wants to focus on things that might be wrong or missing, right, as a survival strategy, right? But now in this day and age, we don't necessarily need to <laughs> get stuck in that old system, right, our ancient wisdom of the body. We have the ability to choose. And just as you shifted your energy through this practice of surrender, I encourage you to surrender again. <laughs> so anytime you feel the feeling of loneliness, not only acknowledging, not only taking good care of, but letting go of those mental formations that life has to be a certain way all the time because it always happens in cycles. We have seasons of great connectedness and seasons of withdrawal or isolation or loneliness. And they're all okay. <laughs> it doesn't have to be wrong. We don't have to judge it and make it an issue. We can just acknowledge it and accept it with openness. And we can step outside of duality. And when you find yourself in a spectrum versus a hard right or hard wrong, or hard happy and a hard sad or sorrow, you realize you can experience the paradox of all of it at once. And there's great beauty in that, great beauty in accepting the fullness of our humanity. So I hope that's helpful and sending you love because I know loneliness too. But at this point in my life, it doesn't last very long. How about when you are comfortable in loneliness and staying connected is the difficult part? Um, can you be more specific, Naz? Staying connected, how? You're saying fear of being vulnerable? Maybe you're more comfortable in isolation because there's um, like a trust issue or a commitment issue or a tender heart because of past hurt. Is that what you're referring to? All of the above. Okay, so if you're at that stage of the cycle, <laughs> right, it's all a cycle. Connection, disconnection, loneliness, hurt. And then when the reconnection starts to happen, you feel, uh-oh, I'm still connected or attached to the hurt from the past, however things ended, right? Because it's, life is full of these paradoxes. In order to grow closer, <laughs> you have to surrender, right? You open yourself up. And there's also this great fear along with this opportunity for great love. You have to surrender these old things. So if you're in this space of being really comfortable alone, recognize it's not as much a comfort of being alone as much as it is no one's touching your wounds, right? So allowing yourself to be in the discomfort to kind of override your caveman biology a bit and say, <clears throat> connection is the gateway to freedom, right? So if you reframe it as a path to freedom, you recognize that what I really want is to be seen and heard and cherished without the heaviness. And I learned a lot from the last time I was in this space. I also had some 
heaviness and pain. And now coming back to building relationships once again, I have the opportunity to take those lessons with me because you're never starting from scratch, right? You're always starting, well, you're not even restarting. It's just a continuum, right? You're continuing from where you ended the last relationship and whatever you learned in this space of isolation. And Naz, I have the benefit of knowing you since I see you in the Beautiful Souls community for our morning meditations regularly for a while now. And I know that you've learned a lot about yourself and grown a lot. So when you're opening yourself up to someone new, know that you're equipped and you're always prepared and ready for what you have coming into your life. Whether that's a new relationship, it goes for anything. You're always ready. The mind, for some reason, because of the fear, we always focus on what we don't want, the thing we're trying to protect ourselves from. And we can be in a cycle of protecting ourselves from this past relationship. That's over. Let it be over. <laughs> Recognize that every moment is new. The only thing that isn't new is us projecting our history onto something. And so sometimes we can't see it. And that makes us very afraid, right? We sit in a fixed position of assuming that every relationship is the same, right? Or even that we're exactly the same and we're changing. We're evolving in every moment, moment to moment, each energetic exchange, each exchange of an idea, each exchange in this meditation we just did. There's always an expansion happening. And so if you don't allow yourself to be open and available to that fact or remember that truth, you'll miss out on a lot of the beauty in life. Get back in there, open up, try again. And be honest, just communicate. I feel like most of the times in relationship, what we're really learning is how to communicate, right? How to communicate our needs, how to communicate our desires, how to communicate where we are without trying to manipulate or control anything, but to simply say, I am excited about the possibility of this connection. I am drawn to you and <laughs> I'm also a little fearful because of my history, but I'm here, I'm available and I want to try and I want you to know where I am so that we can be available to this together, right? You're half of every situation. So if you tend to it well with presence and recognize that each moment is new, there's a possibility for greater hope and more space to actually create what you really desire, right? What you focus on is what you create. So let go of the history, focus on the gifts and the lessons, and stay present to your vision, whatever it might be. If you manifest something for a long time, when it happens, then you don't want it. Is that normal? Yeah, it's very normal. Actually, it happens all the time. How many times in your life have you thought you really wanted to go down a certain career path or date a certain person or then it happens and you feel that resistance? We like to exist. We like to <laughs> allow ourselves to believe that we live in this illusion of being a fixed, having a fixed identity oh, I think I want this and that's going to be so great. And then we get there and we realize there's other layers, unconscious layers, subconscious layers that are surfacing. And this isn't what I thought it was. It's a very natural human thing in all facets of life. And of course it wasn't because you've likely never had it. So how could you know exactly what it was? So it's normal. So you can let that go. And I'll add to that a couple of things. When you are manifesting, the reason it's important to feel, right? Whatever this thing is going, what, 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 uh, what is this fulfilling within you? This money or this career, or this relationship, 
what do you believe, rather, this thing will fulfill <laughs> emotionally, spiritually, psychologically within you. Because if you can get to that, then you start to unlock what your whole reason for desiring this thing is, your relationship to that idea, that part of your identity. Because you'll find often when you get these things, even though they may be a great added benefit to your life, they don't do that other thing that you want it to do. <laughs> that subconscious layer, right? You have to do that for yourself, within yourself. And a lot of it has to do with self-love, understanding the nature of your humanity, your greatest strengths and weaknesses, and learning how to embrace them all without judgment while still being available to your greatest kindness, your most impactful, loving nature, and recognizing that sometimes the thing you wanted is not <laughs> all you thought it would be. And that's okay. Know that you don't know. Do you have tips on getting connected to your creativity again? Yes. My basic rule for getting connected to your creativity is let go of the judgment. That's usually the way we block ourselves. We say it's writer's block. or It's all this pressure we put, our, put on ourselves to be perfect or to be great. So what I like to do is just decide, I'm going to be messy. I'm going to make the most terrible, free, playful thing for no reason. Right? And... The whole point is to get yourself into a state of non-judgment, of openness, to reconnect to your childlike spirit. Where you didn't need a reason, you didn't have to make anything in a certain kind of way. But rather, you realize in the state of it, as you switch your state of being, that you're always creative. We're always creative. Everything in life is creative. The conversation is creative. Right? It's not like you sat there and planned that question or planned any conversation. You have ideas that are spinning in your head and when you get ready to express them, they start to form through the language you know, the tone of voice you know, and the rhythm and ups and downs of your voice, creating a, a melody of music in harmony with what you think the other person can receive and how they might best receive and understand you most clearly to whatever end you might have, whether it's storytelling or being humorous or educating or connecting. All those things are creative. You're always creative. The question is, can you release yourself from the judgment that prohibits your freedom to create? So I would just sit down and decide, I'm going to write something bad. <laughs> And be playful with it. I'm going to write something terrible, right? And then just start writing. Or, you know, I don't know what your creative outlet is. But whatever it is, allow it to be terrible. Have fun with it. Right? Think about any child in your life. A niece, a nephew, a child, a daughter, a son. Um, and how they might approach it. And take on that same energy. And once your state's outside of that judgment, you'll find that. Oh, there was a good idea that came from that practice over time. So that's my advice. Hope that um, is helpful. Mm, protective instinct snaps back like elastic to do it perfectly. Yeah, and it's a dance. It'll come back, right? Because it's part of our insecurity. One of my most liberating um, mantras is every note I play is the right one, right? Something like that as a musician. Every note I play is the right one. It doesn't matter, it's creative art, it's an expression. And of course, if you're you know, writing a book with a thesis or a certain type of song or trying to create a certain type of sculpture, whatever it is, of course there are certain things you need to adhere to. But that first step of allowing everything to be the right one is just to allow yourself to get into a state of flow and openness and freedom. And once you're in that state, there's more room 
for fresh ideas to come and you'll find one that just feels really good and resonates and lifts your spirit and and then you'll take that one down the runway and eventually finish it and share it. I've been searching for my own authenticity, not sure who I am. Hmm, that's, yeah, that's the journey of life. <laughs> Um, there's lots of layers to that. I think it starts with asking, or I'll share with you my process at least, or my belief around who we are. I think that we are like every other thing on this planet, the trees or the other animals, everything they needed to be a perfect version of themselves or their species was there in that fertilized seed at the start of their lives. They didn't have to ask anyone, it was already there within. So it's one of the reasons I'm a big advocate for meditation because when you are grounded in yourself, grounded in what is authentic for you from spending time with yourself in deep thought, not ruminating on the ideas of how others are perceiving you and trying to remain in a codependent pattern, which is what our modern society mostly consists of, you'll find that there's a beautiful, shining, brilliant nature that is naturally you. It may not be your normal. Most of us are not in that normally. What is normal is assimilation, sameness. Silly. No. <laughs> That's not why you're here. That's not why I'm here to be the exact same as everyone else around us, to be on that same path. Um, it's, it makes me laugh now when I hear the way that we, when that comes up in conversations, oh, you're not doing this thing that everybody does? No, <laughs> I'm not, I have no desire to. That feels like the wrong thing for me. Um, so getting back to your authentic self, recognizing that who you are has always been there you just have to take some time and start to ask. Oh, thank you. <laughs> ask the right questions, which are one, who am I? What is my heart longing for? <laughs> and the other that I love to ask, which is when I feel myself drained and there is a, something I've agreed to, I get to now spend a moment with that thing, that decision, that obligation, and ask, why? Why did I say yes to that? Why, why is this draining me? Am I overwhelmed? Is this something I really I want to do, but now I don't have the capacity, right? And as you start to ask these questions, you start getting to the core of your mental formations and your mental formations are basically what make up your default mode network, your way of being in the world, our way of thinking and processing the world. And you'll recognize that either you're in alignment with who you are naturally, or your default mode network has been greatly distorted by a number of traumatic experiences, like all of us, <laughs> most of us that haven't been dealt with. So you are having greater difficulty accessing who you are authentically, which is the reason I'm, I'm having a 30 day challenge at the beginning of the year called the heart of authenticity, reconnecting to our heart, our intuition, our inner knowing and self love to make ourselves available to who we really are. But it takes time, it takes a lot of practice. Um, and it takes a lot of, getting to know yourself in a very intimate way and getting very honest with yourself. So um, I hope that's helpful. And um, yeah, if you want to go on that journey with us, you can sign up. It's at my website, soulcalledjoel.com. Can you speak on bringing harmony to your inner and outer experiences? Hmm. 
Well, it's an interesting question. Harmony to your inner and outer experiences. I think of a couple of things. I think for a long time I lived with a lot of um, incoherence, right, or self-sabotage, or realizing that what I was doing wasn't in alignment with what I wanted in my heart space. It might be feel obligated by the shoulds, the coulds, the have tos, supposed tos. This whole thing of normal versus natural, what's normal in societal reality versus what's natural in your personal spiritual reality. And a lot of times when they don't align, we have this dissonance, right? So bringing harmony to the space is always about letting go of the normal for what's natural. It's, it's that simple. Not easy, <laughs> not always um, the most accessible to know what is really natural for me. I went through several years of asking that question every day. Once I realized, I was very aware of this, I was like, I'm, I'm not living the rest of my life this way. So anytime I felt out of sync or harmony with my inner and outer realms, I would ask, am I doing this because it's natural or because it's normal, right? Is it natural to me or is it normal? And so I had to kind of define natural for a moment. Normal, I think, is easy to define. But what is natural to me? Because we have this thing called the looking glass self. Many of us are not who we think we are, or we're not who the other thinks we are, but we are the version of ourselves that we think the other can receive, right? And we do that with our parents, our siblings, or the world around us. But if you kind of let go of that idea and start parceling it through, I always think of what's natural to me as the most effortless aligned action. And what I mean is it comes very easy, something I'm drawn to, something I would do if nobody paid me or asked me to do. And aligned meaning it brings me great joy or satisfaction or fulfillment, right? So I was playing guitar earlier, right? That feels that the inclination towards guitar is natural something about it that just lifts me towards music in general, right? Inclination towards meditation, spirituality, and then certain foods, certain people, certain places, they lift, right? It's, um, I love to think of it in terms of music as a musician, resonance, right? Things that vibrate together, dissonance, things that have friction, inharmonious. So where's the resonance? That's what's natural. If there's dissonance, then I have to kind of sit with that and say, okay, I don't think that's natural for me. How do I evolve this situation? Excuse me. So that's the trickier part, right? Because as an, an adult, we have responsibilities. It might be work. It might be other things in our life, other dynamics in our relationships, that we have to figure out how can I change this situation into what's natural. Taking that time to be with it through communication with others in your circle. And in some situations you have to make, have, might have to make a very challenging decision or find a great compromise, right? to balance if it's something you know you have to do because we don't live in an idealistic world always and um, I will admit that I have a lot more liberty as a an entrepreneur a, a musician a songwriter a teacher um, a, a non-parent right so the way I get to do that I might have a lot more space in my schedule and my time and my responsibilities than most adults my age. But bringing 
all of these things into harmony, it really starts with our perspective of our lives and the limitations that we put on ourselves based on this fundamental of what's normal versus natural. And you got to know that you're going to leave your comfort zone. So you got to they always say life happens outside of your comfort zone. Your real life, your harmonious life, you're going to lose some friends, right? As Alana said. And I did the same. I lost a lot of people that I loved and cared for. I faced a season of disconnect with my parents for a few years. But during that season, I found great footing and foundation in who I naturally am. And I gave myself an opportunity to embody that through relationship by feeling that resistance and that transition, as well as, in some cases, the reconciliation and the evolution of some of those relationships, because they saw more of who I was and I saw more of who they are and were, and we still chose each other, right? So there's this beautiful dance and I think one of the liberating things, because I know that can be very daunting and feel heavy and can uh, bring up a lot of fear and resistance. But if we think of friendships, all of these things as a continuum, the qualities that you have in one relationship with this person that might be making an exit out of your life will and can be found in another person plus <laughs> the other things you might need in a connection or a friendship, but you have to make yourself available for it and to it, right? Goes back to stop trying to control or manipulate a situation, surrendering and trusting, right? Just like we did in our meditation practice, um, swinging on that trampeze held by source, the divine. Knowing that you will always have everything you need. So that harmony, it really starts with harmony within yourself. It's for me, I, I always get to this uh, idea of grabbing the weed by the root. Or what's at the root of this thing? It's always you. The creativity thing, we are creating our lives. We may have shown up in a state of victim consciousness. We may very well have been and are victims to certain situations. But the state of being that we show up to that situation with determines our outcome. One of the most powerful examples of this I can think of is Frederick Douglass. I remember it was my final year of college. Definitely had senioritis. And I did not want to do anything. <laughs> I remember being at the coffee house, had all of my books in front of me, and I was just listening to records, like testing, texting friends. And, and then my intuition was telling me to read uh, The Narrative of a Slave by Frederick Douglass. I had the book with me I'd been reading. And I got to the part in the book where he realized that he was free, even while he was still enslaved. And he claimed it for himself every day. And he would trade in his lunch to read books so that he would empower himself. And because he, even though he was a victim to slavery, right? If he did something wrong, they'd try to whip him and fight him. Anytime they tried to whip him and fight him because he believed he was free, he would fight his slaver every time, right? Not an easy task. Thankfully, most of us don't have to deal with anything that graphic or visceral and painful. But every time he did until finally he escaped because they knew they couldn't make him a victim, right? He wasn't in a space of victim consciousness. They didn't allow, didn't allow his spirit to be broken. And that shifted something for me in a very big way, realizing, well, one, I have it way easier than Frederick Douglass, though the world is not perfect. And two, this as a man, a person, a woman, thinketh, so is he, she. 
what we're talking about is your state of being, not just the ideas ruminating in your mind, but what is the state of being you embody? Do you embody freedom? Do you embody wholeness? Do you embody self-love? Is that frequency moving through you so that you manifest freedom like he did? Or that you manifest more loving and harmonious connections in your life because you are in harmony with yourself, no longer in a state of disconnect, right? between the mind and the heart or self-sabotage, but willing to make the tough decisions to break the old structure and create a new one. That's really what it's all about. Hmm. Yeah, Alana, so much surrendering, so much surrendering, surrendering. So, so many lessons from these stories when you start to realize what kind of <laughs> mental uh, facility and capacity must it have taken after being in a society where it was just to have slaves everything in the world what was normal <laughs> was that black people were slaves in this country and owned by other men and he said I'm free <laughs> And I love that because indeed he manifested his freedom and because he knew he was free. He wouldn't let anybody treat him like he was free, like he was anything other than free rather. And he would fight them off just as he should. Right. And because of that, I have greater freedoms today and we all have so much more freedom. Think about the ripple effect of him, Harriet Tubman and others. And think about all of the ripple effect of all people across all forms of injustice. Think about the ripple effect of what we get to exchange in this space from my own work and your own work and your personal life from the ways you've shifted. And that's how we create a more harmonious inner and outer world by connecting to more people who, as Harriet, not Harriet Tubman, but um, <laughs> um, Howard Thurman would say, more people who have come alive, truly come alive. Hmm. Yeah. So I think on that note, I'm going to bid you all farewell. Thank you for joining me for this um, impromptu meditation and a uh, bit of a conversation Q&A. Again, the themes, I'm going to share with you again these themes from these cards that we pulled. Open yourself to a positive new emotional experience. Fulfilling romantic relationships, deep and lasting spiritual insights. That's the Ace of Raphael, the Ten of Raphael. Love and blessings fill your life. Harmonious relationships with family members and a happily ever after. And finally, release the past. You will grow from every situation. A time to heal all wounds. So, for all of you, may you heal. May you expand, may you surrender, and may you thrive. Have a wonderful night, beautiful souls, and we'll see you soon. Much love and light. Peace.